Now listen, I don't want any more bullshit. bullshit. Hey, look, let's keep it real. An announcement was made Sunday night. Your Indianapolis Colts go down to San Francisco and drop 30 points on the 49ers in the middle of a fucking monsoon, in the middle of a fucking hurricane bomb or whatever they call it, driving rain. They win the game 30 to 18 and it wasn't even that close to be honest. What happened is your Colts made an announcement on national TV to the world and to the rest of the NFL. They are officially on a roll and not fucking around along with a second announcement, which was the arrival of the league's new young dynamic duo in Jonathan Taylor, of course, and MP motherfucking J. Michael Pittman Jr. was sensational, as he has been the entire season, but especially the last three weeks, he's been announcing his motherfucking presence. Jonathan Taylor was sensational. When you take into account the rain, the weather, Carson Wentz was fantastic. The offensive line played really well. The defense looked great except for two drives. The maniac was the maniac. Magnificent as always. Xavier Rhodes returns to form, comes up with a huge interception. Look, it wasn't a perfect game, and it's not like San Francisco or world beaters, but they're not a pushover either. And to do what they did on the road in the driving rain on national television. The Colts made it clear Sunday night. The 0-3 start notwithstanding, the Colts basically said, fuck what you heard. We're a team to be reckoned with. And y'all gonna have to fuck with us. And I'm gonna jump deeper into what we saw Sunday night and what it means going forward. But before we do, let me be the resplendent host that I always am and welcome you back Or if it's your first time, homie, welcome you to the NFL's number one rated uncensored podcast in the world. The one and only, often imitated, never duplicated, ever original, ever defiant, and always unfiltered. The Bullshit Free Colts Podcast. The only podcast on the planet, my friend, where you can hear all things worth talking about as it pertains to your beloved and my beloved Indianapolis Colts. But unlike anywhere else in the world, here, baby, you get it with no coach speak, no PR, no spin, no political correctness, and most importantly, and ever enduringly, with no fucking bullshit. Now, is that audio quality good enough for you? Is that up to your standards, Craig? You smart mouth motherfucker. (laughs) I mean, dude, I'm not an R&B singer here doing slow jam music so you get some pussy, bro. We're here talking football. We're talking Colts. All you need is to be able to hear what I'm saying. You don't need fucking Dolby HDR sound. Man, come on, bro. you still my guy, though, Craig. It's all good. Anyway, I'm your host, Harkon Ajala, at your motherfucking service, as always. And like I said at the very beginning, the Colts made an announcement And we're going to break down what that announcement was, what it means for where they are right now, and what it means for where they're going. Because I don't know what y'all saw. I don't know if y'all picking it up like I'm picking it up. But I'm watching the stew that's coming together. I'm watching it all come together, this gumbo that is the 2021 Indianapolis Colts. And I'm liking what I'm smelling. I'm liking what I'm smelling. I'm going to go ahead and bite a little bit from your man Kwame Brown. Boy, the Colts got some fucking mamas cooking going on, and they opening it up on motherfuckers. So let's jump into it. Let's break it down. But before we do, I'm edgy. I make off-color jokes. I don't hold my tongue, and I do not bullshit. And as you probably figured out by now, yeah, I curse quite a bit. But hey, only because it's fun, or if you need it to be a little more upscale, I speak in the Vulgate, as did the Bard, a.k.a. one William Shakespeare. But one thing's for certain, based on the first two, three minutes of this podcast, if you're still here right now, I know it, and you know it, you're a motherfucking pimp. So what I need you to do right now to help us out, take your pimp-ass index finger and smash that like button down below so that the algorithm shares this podcast far and wide with other cool-ass, bleeding blue, die-hard Colts fan motherfuckers like yourself. It's free to you, but it's absolutely priceless to us, and I appreciate it 
every time you do it. So make sure you smash that like button right now. Make sure you share this with other cool motherfuckers like yourself. Make sure you subscribe so you get a notification every time I drop one of these bad boys. And if you appreciate what we're doing, you can always support the podcast by donating down below. There are three different ways to do it. And if you're a real deal, Holyfield Colts motherfucker, Colts loving motherfucker, you can join our by popular demand and request Bullshit Free Colts Podcast VIP Patreon. There's a link right below. You can join it and get the best shit available anywhere uncensored. Even shit that's not fit for YouTube. All right. So now that we got all of that out of the way, the housekeeping's out of the way, it's time for us to do what you love. Let's move on from all the introduction, setup, and exposition, and let's chop it the fuck up. I mean, look, I was honest with you. A few weeks ago, when the Colts won their first game and they beat down Miami, I told you I was in the same place you were. I wasn't sure exactly what I'd seen. They looked good. But I wasn't sure if what we were seeing is the Colts turning the corner as we thought they would. As, you know, they started to get more and more people back and everybody on the same page. Or if, you know, the Jacoby Brissett-led Miami Dolphins were just straight trash. Because, you know, the Dolphins had not looked like trash the week before when they took the Raiders down to the wire and almost beat them in overtime. It's not really a surprise. I've told you guys this before. You know, you can get all excited and carried away if you want to when these teams get on a run playing the fifth place schedule. You know, Cincinnati's going through the same thing right now. People getting all fucking carried away and talking about their contenders and playoff sureties and all that bullshit. I'm like, I mean, okay, but you've been bad for like 74 fucking years in a row. I mean, it only makes sense at some point, right? The stars got to align where you could, you know, be five and two. But again... That's that fifth place schedule. Wait till next year if the Bengals do win 9, 10, 11 games. Wait till next year when you got the first or second place schedule. And then we'll find out how far you've really come. More likely you're going to be like Miami. But again, you know, that's talking about other teams. Let's go back to the Colts. As I said before, I mean, after the Colts beat Miami in convincing fashion, who knew whether we were seeing real progress, real substance, or this was just fool's go. But, you know, four games later, where they've won three out of four and all three wins by double digits, and it should have been four since they were up 19 fucking points against the Ravens on the road on national TV with 12 minutes left. And even then, even though their defense completely collapsed with a couple of guys that were playing in the secondary who's likely to be picking you up in an Uber next Tuesday, in spite of that collapse, They still should have won the fucking game. Carson Wentz drove him down the field with 39 seconds left, put him in position to pull the damn thing out anyway. But in true Colts 2021 bad fucking luck fashion, they also happen to have their, you know, their only starting kicker injured, you know, with some kind of hip thing. He goes on the IR right after the game. But in the meantime, he misses a 47-yard kick wide right that would have won the fucking thing. So again, four games later, it's pretty clear what we're seeing is not a mirage or fool's gold or, you know, just the benefit of a soft schedule or some bullshit like that. The Colts are the real deal. They are a team to be reckoned with like many of us thought they would be. They have some flaws like every NFL team. But yeah, what you're seeing is not a test. You know, when I say the Colts are talent wise, When I say they are a contender to at least make the playoffs in the AFC, it's not cap. That's real talk. And like I said, for proof, all you got to do is look at the numbers from what happened on the field Sunday night. And again, keep in mind, this is in the driving crazy rain, which is why although San Francisco is not an offensive juggernaut of any type, again, in the driving rain, they hold San Francisco to 169 total passing yards. 111 rushing yards, which might not sound that great, except when you factor in that the fucking San Francisco 49ers running back had like 90 yards on the first drive or some crazy shit like that. They held San Francisco to 5.3 average yards per play, held them to 18 points. And like I said, it really wasn't that close because keep this in mind, the Colts win 30 to 18, but the game started off nine to zero San Francisco. 
So the Colts outscored them 30 to 9 over the last, what, 45 minutes of the game? But the Colts themselves ran for 148 yards on the ground, scored 30 points. The Colts forced four turnovers, two fumbles, and two interceptions. They sacked Jimmy G twice. They hold San Francisco to 9% on third down efficiency. That's fucking. I don't even know how you. I don't even know how you do that. You do. You get one third down. I think that. I think the fucking San Francisco 49ers had like one third down conversion. And when the shit really gets crazy and kind of spicy as fuck, is when you start looking at some of the individual performances. Oh, and even before we do that, here's something we need to talk about as a team. Remember when they used to have serious red zone problems? Not no more. They're getting in the fucking end zone all the time now. As a matter of fact, they forced four turnovers, and they got three touchdowns off of three of those turnovers. So this is no bullshit, right? Okay, the Colts put up from Jonathan Taylor 107 yards on just 18 carries, which is 5.94 yards per carry. Okay, so JT with six yards per carry for the game. Michael Pittman Jr. has 105 yards receiving and a touchdown, the game ceiling touchdown, by the way, and that's only on four catches. And by the way, that game ceiling touchdown, whoo-hoo, man, I told y'all. I mean, MPJ, Michael Pittman Jr., it's official now. He has fucking arrived, and he is the guy. That, that touchdown catch that sealed the deal, was a thing of fucking wonder and beauty. I mean, that was a Hall of Fame type reception, and I'm not engaging in hyperbole. Go back and watch it. Not only the catch, but how he does it and the time he does it in the clutch to win the game. And then the 50-plus yard reception that he had earlier where he literally goes back and just yanks the ball away from the defensive back, like right in front of the defensive back, like, Bitch, move. Get out the way. Some old ludicrous shit. Man, MPJ. Here's what I see when I watch him. It's like he's reached that point now where he knows I can dominate. Like he knows it. You know, you you have that point where you think you can. You feel confident you can. Now he's playing like, oh, I know I can dominate. And he is fucking balling. I mean balling. Carson Wentz, another fantastic game. Maybe the numbers don't appear like it on the surface because he only had 150 yards, but he's 17 for 26. And again, this is in a rainstorm, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Now, I know there's a caveat, you know, you you negative Nancy motherfuckers out there. Oh, you yeah, he threw three or four that should have been, man, would have, could have, should have. If a frog had a glass ass, would he still hop? I mean... I agree. There were a few balls. Let me say this. I went back and looked at the game. Yes, two of those four were probably just bad throws in his part. But you couldn't see clearly on the other two. It's just a matter of the rain. One of them got tipped. Uh, you know, you could see it slip out of his hand. But even still, even still, 106.2 passer rating. He also had four carries for 23 yards including a fucking big boy. That 17-yard run he made on second and 15 was critical, and that was big time. Plus, he had a touchdown. Fourth consecutive game for Wentz with a passer rating higher than 106. He's now registered multiple touchdowns and zero interceptions in four straight games, which ties Peyton Manning for the longest streak in Colts history. And it's also the NFL's longest active streak. So this ain't no fucking hocus pocus, you know, looking for ways to try to make this guy appear good, as Austin Gale might say up at PFF. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. You're watching it with your eyes, and you're seeing it reflected in the numbers. Wentz is fucking balling. He had another 57-yard pass, which, by the way, He's completed at least one pass of 50 yards in three consecutive games. First time he's done that in his career. It's fucking crazy. The offensive line continued to get better and better and look better and better and play better and better. They only give up one sack, and really that was a a coverage sack where 
Carson just kind of was like, okay, I got to give up on this one. Other than that, Carson had plenty of time throughout the day. Of course, you can see with the running game that they blocked their asses off. So did the receivers, by the way. Mo Ali Cox had another touchdown reception. Oh, and the defense. Well, I mean, Darius Leonard continues to be all pro. Like, whatever's happening, he always fucking makes big plays. He has another forced fumble to go along with seven tackles. al Muhammad gets a solo tackle, a sack, and a forced fumble. Quiddy Pay recovers that said fumble. And by the way, I know there's you know, motherfuckers out here that want to continue to talk me to death about Danico Autry and, and Ballard should have let him go. Look, al Muhammad is giving us exactly what Danico Autry was giving us, maybe a little more. If you don't believe me, go check the stats. You can watch it with your eyes, but go check the stats. The other thing about Quiddy Pay that I was really excited and happy to see he was getting really good pressure throughout that game. He really should have had one or two sacks if he'd have taken better angles. He'll get better at that as he learns. He's a rookie, but he should have had a sack or two yesterday because he was in position. He, uh, he just didn't take as good angles. That's why the de- the entire defense really, Flus called a, a better game for sure, but really the biggest difference is the pressure that Quiddy and al Quddin Muhammad in the defensive line was getting on Jimmy G throughout the game. I felt like Coach Reich called a great game, one of the best games he's called this year, maybe in the last two years, considering the situation, the elements, and everything. Stayed aggressive, stayed unpredictable, went for the win on third down late in the game instead of trying to run three conservative-ass plays and kick the field goal. I really thought the game he called was masterful. Xavier Rhodes comes up with two passes defensed and an interception. Defoe Buckner against his old team. This was so sweet to see. Five solo tackles, a tackle for a loss, and a sweet as fucking candy sack on the last play of the game. That was beautiful. Kari Willis comes up with a pass defense, six tackles, and an interception. The kicker they brought in hit his field goal when he had to, which is great. Rigoberto Sanchez. Great punting, pinned two punts inside the 20-yard line, had a 79-yard punt in the second quarter. I mean, again, this was a fucking solid thrashing on national television in inclement weather. And this is still with them being, still beset with some serious injuries. Rocky Sin still didn't play. Uh, Braden Smith wasn't back yet. Paris Campbell's missing. Julian Blackman is gone for the season. They're still hurting, but they're getting it done. And by the way, on the defense, because I've I've been on their asses, especially Okereke, because he's been ass a few times this season. I've been on their asses when they haven't played well in coverage, but they were fantastic Sunday night. They were fantastic Sunday night. So what you're seeing is not a fucking mirage. You don't have to be like typical Indiana slash Indianapolis fans and be all self-deprecating and unconfident and try to downplay when your team's playing well, okay? Oh, I mean, well, we'll see what happens when they play a, a better team and all that bullshit. They're playing well, period, end of story. Now, the question is, what does that mean going forward? Well, here's the deal. Here's the great thing. We got a real simple, easy answer. We're going to find out what it means for true, as they say down south, for true over the next three games. Because here's the deal. If the Colts win the next three games, they're in fucking business, baby. They're in fucking business, no matter what the Titans do. Because if the Colts win the next three, that means they beat the Titans. The Colts will be sitting at six and four. And the Titans, even if they win the two tough-ass games after the Colts, the best they could be is seven and three. So the Colts would be sitting right there within one game and they'd be tied in terms of the head to head. So the Colts win the next three, they're in business and we'll know for sure that they're ready to contend to make the playoffs. But you got to win the next three and it starts this Sunday, right? I don't have to tell you how big this fucking game is. At this point, this is the game of the season. Because if you lose to Tennessee, it doesn't mathematically put you out of the playoffs or anything like that. But 
for all intents and purposes, you're toast because you'll be back four games. You'll be sitting three and five. They'll be six and two with the tiebreaker having beat you twice. And they'll be ahead of you in the AFC tiebreaker too. So you'll be pretty much out of the running for the division title if you lose Sunday. So they got to go down there and they got to take care of business in the Luke. Knock off Tennessee, and then, of course, you got to win the next two. You, If you're serious, you got to beat the Jets and the Jags. I don't give a fuck. They go back in the time machine and trade for Joe Flacco's 10-year younger self. You got to beat the Jets and the Jags. And, hey, my thing is let's beat them fucking soundly, too. Let's beat them soundly. Let's beat them so bad that Urban Meyer ends up having to explain why he was caught on video getting a lap dance in PTs by some chick with a C-section scar that runs halfway around her back. Because we take care of business over the next three, and we're sitting at six and four with seven to play, then fuck, you can go f- even four and three of those last seven and have 10 wins and have a really good shot of getting into the playoffs, even if you don't win the division. But at six and four, back one game with Tennessee, I like our chances at winning the fucking division outright and getting that home playoff cooking, baby. Talk about mama's fucking cooking. Let's go out and fucking do it. We're getting healthier. We're not getting Paris back for a while, if ever, this season, but he wasn't really doing much anyway. The only guy not coming back that really, really hurts is Julian Blackman. But, hey, it is what it is. We just got to strap him up and move forward. But, shit, it's all in front of us now. We've literally battled back into the position to where we can have all of our destiny in our hands right now. If we take care of business over these next three games, starting with Sunday against the Tennessee motherfucking Titans, And based on the way they've been balling out over these last four, I'm feeling really fucking good about it. And I'm dying to eat my words that I said that they were toast for the season when they were 0-3. I'm dying to get on a podcast and tell y'all how wrong I was. And I'm starting to think that that's exactly what's going to happen. Because I'm liking what the fucking Colts is cooking. Y'all got that rock reference? (laughs) <laughs> my son watches that shit all the time anyway look that's what i saw y'all let me know in the comments if y'all on the same page with me and you think this is the real deal or if you think this is fool's gold and i'm just blowing smoke up my own ass let me know in the comments i welcome it at all times whether you agree with me or not so i'm gonna see y'all during the game on twitter as always talking shit and chopping it up In the meantime, I'm going to leave y'all with the message I leave you with every week. The same message that I'm sending out to any Colts player, coach, or front office person that might be listening and watching because I know some of y'all do because you get at me. It's our time now. We battle back from the edge of the fucking abyss. And now our destiny is in our hands to go out and make some shit happen this season. So let's go out. Play like fucking maniacs. Leave it all on the field. Take care of business this Sunday and beat the fucking brakes off Tennessee. And let's go out from there and win another fucking Lombardi, baby. Peace.